So before I get started through this, I just want to get to know the audience a bit more. So um, obviously, I like fungi, and I hope you do too. How many of you came because you like fungi? Excellent. How many were forced to come with a significant other? Okay. <laughs> Um, how many have belonged to or have heard of the Vancouver Mycological Society? Okay, awesome. What about um, Metro Vancouver Park Restoration work? Has anyone done any of that? I know mine has. Okay, awesome. So throughout this, I'm going to talk about mycorrhizal fungi, but it's also going to go into other things as well. So I would like you to ask questions and interact with me. It reduces my amount of talking, and it also allows you to interact and ask questions. So please feel free to ask me things. I often do things in non-lecture format and be more interactive, but I'm not going to make you think trees or anything like I've had to do with poor undergrads. So you could, if you want to be an interpretive dance, we could have you be trees and mycorrhizal fungi. It's really your choice. So I'm going to get started, and a little bit more about me is um, I love science and art and teaching. So I'm, in addition to my PhD, I'm also doing a certificate program, so I won't embarrass him, but there's a professor in here giving me feedback on how I address questions. So another reason why I would love questions is then I can address them. So without further ado, I will go with why mycorrhiza are way cool. Now, I think they're cool, but I'm going to go in for why you guys think they're cool. So they can help plants grow. So mycorrhizae, or fungus root, are symbiosis um, between plants and fungi that are beneficial for plants with respect to growth. And as you can see here, um, this is a picture from one of my lab mates, and you can see there's this cottony looking structure, and this is actually fungus that is has infected this root and it helps with the uptake of nutrients. And this diagram here, which I've drawn, you'll see a lot of pictures because for many reasons I like to doodle and also um, it's harder to get images for copyright reasons. So if I get annoyed, then I'll just draw it. So I may end up trying to do picture books. So if anyone's interested in that as well, I know that some people like to have drawings as well and things. So this is to illustrate the idea that if you have a tree and, and you have another tree and they're under the same exact conditions, so just imagine you're planting it in your garden, you're like, okay, tree. And then you go and put it in exactly the same thing over here. And one of them, you maybe put mesh around it so it can't have mycorrhizae and you get rid of the fungal soup. And then the other one, you allow it to have mycorrhizal fungi. Ooh, looks much happier and bigger. So it's really important to realize that it's not just the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil that keeps trees happy, but it is one component. So another thing that my mom especially loves are orchids. And so mycorrhizal fungi are especially important to grow orchids. How many of you have an orchid at home? How many of you have killed your orchids off? <laughs> How many of you have had your friend rescue them your orchid or something along those lines. So I have a friend who rescues, is a orchid whisperer. So one of the things, if you have very tiny um, seeds, because orchids are very, very almost uh, dust-like, is they do have to have a symbiosis associated with them, so mycorrhizal fungi, because that allows them to get the nutrition that they normally need. Otherwise, you'll have to do a nutrient regime for it. So it's really important for germination to have um, mycorrhizal fungi. Now, orchids are really cool in that some of them will become photosynthetic and allow the sort of the symbiosis where the um, plant gives the sugars to the fungus and the fungus gives the nutrients to the plant. But some orchids are not particularly um, friendly to their um, fungal host in that they don't give anything at all because they're actually um, non-photosynthetic, and these are called mycoheterotrophs. So that's just a sidebar. Has anyone heard of mycoheterotrophs? Yeah, well, of course. He's a professor that studies these sort of things. So <laughs> it's okay. Um, what can, can you tell me something, Rob, about mycoheterotrophs? Yes, of course. And what kind of, what are some examples in BC of mycoheterotrophs? Yeah, no, not all of them are. So, has anyone heard of uh, 
trying to think if there's any other names for it, but Indian pipe, because I was trying to think if there was a non, a PC version of it, but the white sort of, that is a mycoheterotroph, so there could be another one. No, it's not an orchid, but it's a mycoheterotroph. Yes, I will be kept on my toes by this plant physiologist throughout, so it's all good. So does anyone have any questions about that, or are you all good? All right, moving on to the next slide. Then. All right, so they can also form underground networks. So um, mycorrhizal fungal networks are like the wood wide web. And how many of you have heard of this? Because a lot of people come up to me at dinner parties and go, have you read this book? Have you seen this TED talk? I'm, yes, my supervisor is the one that's doing this. So <laughs> Um, she is so awesome, and she is my professor, and she's like a mother tree, and here she's standing right next to a mother tree. So someone who raised their hand, can they explain what she means by mother tree? Does anyone know what she's meaning by mother tree? Anybody at all? What do you, what do you think she might mean? And I'm going to pick on my dad, because I know he'll have the answer. Okay, so the idea with... The mother tree, and again, this is hypothesized, and they're shown by doing um, experiments. So, not every ecosystem, not every system may not ha have these sort of interactions. But the idea is you'll have a mother tree, and you'll have mycorrhizal fungi coming out of this tree, and you, you'll have little seedlings around the tree. And sometimes, if those little seedlings are, are releasing, um, oh, I'm stressed, or all these different hormones then the, the mother tree may end up sending um, uh, nutrients and things through the mycorrhizal network. Uh, also, it has to do with sources and sinks, which is the idea is if you have a lot of concentration of something here and lower there, it will go this way. So um, she talks a lot about um, the mother tree. So it's just a way of labeling this concept of having a large tree with a, and being able to network into other other small trees, yes. So there's a there's a TED talk, and there's also this um, mother tree uh, YouTube video, and so and there's also she's written a lot of um, accessible for the public articles as well. And depending on who interviews her, she gets more um, philosophical or more scientific. So just be aware of that. She knows all the science very very well. So, but she's also a very good science communicator, so she'll sometimes use analogies and things that might be like a little bit off of the science, but she still knows all of, and does all the experiments for it. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes. Well, actually, another thing studied in the lab is if they're, they're more related, they tend to be better at transporting it through. So that's kind of cool. There's a kin relationship going on there. So that, that's kind of neat. So there's studies to look at how related you are to that tree and how likely it is to be networked with you. Yeah, which is kind of cool. And so this is part of that YouTube video in that you have this tree here, and then it has really cool sound effects, and it goes over here, and the, car the, this is the carbon dioxide moves from this over to here. So, yeah. And I don't know. It's fun to go running around in the forest and be like, oh, cool, that tree might be networked to that tree or that tree. So I now go into forests. And first of all, I can tell if they're even aged and or all these other things because I've been in forestry. I started off in biology, so it's kind of cool to now know where the forest came from. But I also think of the below ground and wonder how it's networked together, potentially. And then another cool thing is it's not just trees. Some of the understory could be in interacting, and there's different types of mycorrhizal fungi, which we'll get into in just a second. Okay, so here's more on these networks. So there's a really interesting study with tomato that shows this idea that mycorrhizal networks can transport things besides nutrients, so um, possibly defense compounds, and you can also have water as well. So imagine you're in your garden, so everyone think in their garden, how many of you have tomatoes? All right, anything else like peppers, trees, nothing? All right, so you have something growing in the ground that gets chewed on by aphids. I'm sure everyone's had that happen. And then you have another related type of plant over there that hasn't been chewed on by aphids yet, which is very unlikely, but let's pretend it has for this example. And what happens here is this goes, gets very, very stressed and releases hor um, hormones to say that it's really stressed. 
And then there has been studies to show with mutants and all these different things that it's very likely that those stress hormones can then get transported through the network up to this, and this can start releasing anti-herbivory compounds and stuff like that. So there is communication through this, which is pretty cool. It's another reason why they're way cool. And also, they can vary in genetics and form and function, which I think is cool because, you know, something being pink and funky in the ground and purple mushrooms. So I have a friend who studies purple cordinarius mushrooms, which I think is kind of cool, which are networked into trees. So how many of you know about different types of mycorrhizal fungi? Because some of you will know. All right, I know two of you. <laughs> um, so there isn't just one type of mycorrhiza, as I'm sure you can imagine. There are many types. Well, not many, many, but there are a couple. I'm just going to go over the two major ones. There's ectomycorrhizae, which are um, associated often with conifer trees, such as Douglas fir. And what they do is they they make a sheath. Or, so I'm going to try to show you. So here's your root, right? And then imagine a sheath around it. And then imagine some of the hyphae going around the cells, but not actually in them. So you have your mantle and your heart net. And so what happens is, and then also that has mycelia that are out. So mycelia is the fungal body that goes all over so that it, that helps it get in the nutrients into the, into the plant that are outside of the plant. And then they're also um, arbuscular that, well, because science and biology is always so complicated and makes everyone's heads hurt, they don't do that. They go inside the cell. So they make arbuscules, which are, they look like little trees inside the roots. And they also have um, fungi that goes outside as well, but it tends to be different structures. And because there's not just two, there's things like um, orchid mycorrhiza and there's ericoid. So it's not a particularly good depiction of it, but things like salal or ericoid, and that's a whole other ball of wax. But if you want to know the two main ones that people tend to talk about is those two. And how many people know which ecosystems might be associated with which? I know that two of you probably do. Has anyone heard about these, that there's different fungi depending on what ecosystem you're in at all? Okay, cool. So you can learn something there. Um, so depending on the nutrient regime and uh, what type of plants you have growing, you'll have different types of mycorrhizal fungi. So often in grasslands, you'll have arbuscular because they tend to be associated with grasses. And then, for example, in a forest, you tend to have a lot of ectomycorrhizal fungi, so with Douglas fir. But the cool thing is the cedar actually is arbuscular. So there's exceptions to everything because life is complicated. That's what I've, that's why my brain always hurts as a biology student. Um, and then what I'm trying to depict here is there's different, um, when you have ecto, because they do form these really uh, quite easy to see structures on the outside of the root, you can get many different morphotypes. And so morphotyping is, was used a lot in the past to um, understand what might have been in, um, colonizing a tree root. And then with the invent like the advancement of DNA sequencing and all these things is you do morphotyping, but you can also do all these other things where you can find out by um, sending your samples to lab to see the co community based on the genetics. So we've really had a huge revolution with DNA technology, but the most important thing in my mind anyway, is to integrate physiology and ecology and microbiology and molecular techniques because it's integrated whole that lets us understand mycorrhizae the best, right? It's not just one or the other. So everyone has their favorite camp, but I think they all matter. And so it is nice that there are people even doing natural history still because some people get left off the funding boat. And we all need, these are all very important for understanding the diversity and the form and the function of mycorrhizae because we still don't know that much compared to what we could. Because I think of it as that it's a lot of work to dig into the ground versus, you know, above ground. You can just go and take a plant, but you have to dig quite a bit to go down. Does anyone have any questions about this slide at all? It looks like someone might be in the back. Okay. Uh, also, uh, some of the things on my t-shirt are micro-resil. Can anyone, does anyone know their mushrooms? 
I get to wear cool t-shirts as a grad student, so that's neat. Yeah, so this one, do not eat it, but it is mycorrhizal. Um, and I had a friend that would go uh, into the forest after fires in the Okanagan and pick morels. Those are mycorrhizal. And uh, anyone that's heard of Belize, those are mycorrhizal. And I don't advocate people eating mushrooms because I don't want anyone to not identify them and get sick or anything. But they're the My Vancouver Mycological Society, if you join them, a lot of them know what they're doing. And some of them are on the poison control, like some of them help do the uh, advising when things like that happen. So they're, they're a safer group to go to. Because I don't actually like eating wild mushrooms. I'm kind of weird that way. And chanterelles. Has anyone had chanterelles? Yeah, those are my corrosive too. So another thing that's way cool is that they are edible for most of you. Because that's why most people like fungi is because they're edible. All right. So a lot of times when you hear about mycorrhiza, you hear more about the nutritional aspect. But there's a lot more to mycorrhiza than just nutrition. So you can imagine, and this is kind of more related to the research I'm doing, is how do these mycorrhiza relate to the tree and possibly other things like invertebrates? So those are um, things like insects and uh, worms and all these different things. So these are the complex multiple interactions that say the the nutrient nutrition goes up or maybe it helps better with stress because mycorrhizae can also help with stress tolerance. Um, possibly that could affect its compounds that it releases in its leaves like we were talking about. So that can have other impacts. So this is just complex multiple, they call them in science speak multi-trophic, so multiple feeding interactions, multi-trophic interactions. And then there's a bit of debate on this still, but the idea is sort of like lichens, there could be some mineralization um, breakdown from mycorrhizal root um, compounds. I was reading a paper on that today suggesting that there's still, there are some suggestions that it does, but people like to debate in science until it's absolutely certain. So we always have to say that there is potential to not know for certain. So glomalin is a really cool thing in that um, it suggests from uh, current studies that it helps bind the soil together. It's a soil structure. So that soil that you tend to think of when you're in a forest uh, or in a grassland and things, it could be related to this glomalin. Um, of course, and all the other lovely soil food web uh, components that are due to things like soil nematodes and earthworms and all those things. And carbon cycles, so everyone's talking about carbon monoxide and things. Uh, because the plant makes these carbon compounds and then gives it as its, oh, thank you, thank you so much for the nutrients to the mycorrhizal fungi, the, the fungus has a huge store of carbon, right, coming from the plant, and then it makes this huge network of, of mycorrhizal fungi. So this has implications on the carbon cycle. So again, there's different talks about how it might be affecting carbon storage and stuff like that. And I'm a little bit skeptical about some of it, but there is a lot of, uh, like, I do know it's storing it. But then again, it's like the carbon storage in trees and stuff. You cut the trees down. then. So I think there's a lot of good research on this, and I'm not sure the answer. So you can ask me questions, and then I'll try to find papers and things for you if you want. But I think that's an interesting avenue is how is it relating to the carbon cycle. It definitely is, but, like, what implications does it have applied for people beyond the scientific realm is kind of what I meant by that. And another thing that's really kind of interesting is that uh, not only are the mycorrhiza interacting with the plant, but the bacteria, there are bacteria that interact with the mycorrhiza, which interact with the plant. And there's also bacteria, of course, that interact with the plant without the mycorrhiza, but it's cool that you have these growth-promoting bacteria that are not just interacting with the plant, but also the mycorrhiza, and they're there are multiple uh, community going on there. And then food in the soil, food web. So then the lovely thing about the all this carbon being there in the fungal structure is that it can be food for lots of the soil, food web. So a lot of people think of soil and they think, and again, if you're a soil scientist, the word dirt makes you cringe. So people think dirt. And my dad likes to bug me by saying dirt. He's done this since I was much younger and I, I don't, give in anymore. I just like, whatever, you can say, you can say dirt. But the idea is this just rocks and pebbles and brown stuff. Well, good, healthy soil has bacteria, it has um, fungi, it has nematodes, it has a whole community. 
and unless those components are there in, a, in the right amounts, your soil tends to need things like added um, fertilizer and all these sort of things. So there's researchers that are looking into how can you have a healthy soil food web so that you don't have um, the issue that the UN has mentioned in 2015 that soil is a non-renewable resource and it was the year of the soil in 2015 to try to raise awareness to the public of how important soil is. Because, you know, soil is brown and people don't tend to, unless they're a gardener, they don't tend to interact with it too much. So it is really important to realize that soil can be degraded if uh, things like mycorrhiza and other components are not properly um, taken care of, and we can help with that. So there's also growth and diversity and nutrition. So if you have plants that are able to survive in certain habitats because they're in this association, and then certain other plants aren't as good at that, so then it will affect which plants are growing where. So that kind of gives you some, there's many, many other examples of how um, mycorrhiza could be involved in the ecosystem because it, ecosystems are very complicated, and I'm sure there's things that we'll find in like five years from now that they haven't really helped yet. So does anyone have any questions about that? But humans can hurt them by overusing fertilizers. So I'm now going to make you guys do a little bit of interacting. Why do you think this relationship might be the way that it is? So you can take a look there. Anyone have any hints? Yes. Exactly, right? It's a relationship. Like if you're in a relationship and someone's just gotten everything they need and your role in that relationship isn't useful anymore, why would you need to be in that, right? So it's the idea that if you have enough nutrition, you won't really need to have this helper with you. And also sometimes what will happen is mycorrhizae can kind of cheat or they can become parasitic. There's a continuum. So it's really important to think about the type of things we do in our environment because it can promote... Um, having a loss of this natural um, mycorrhizal association. Does that make sense? Does everyone understand that? So there's, in science we like, a, at least in ecology, I've seen so many arrows, this continuum, everywhere. So here's the higher to lower, and, and here you'd have, well, I'm happy by myself, I do not want you. And then over here you have this morphotype, because mycorrhizae kind of look funny, some on um, tree roots, and it's pretty happy to give you some services because low nutrients. So another thing that can happen, um, this is actually at Malcolm Knapp Research Forest where I'm doing uh, research with uh, Dr. Suzanne Smart, and um, clear cuts can impact mycorrhizal networks. If you rip up all the soil, you're not going to have that, all those mycelia, and it can cause huge issues. I'm not actually looking at, I'm more looking at the seedling scale and not the networks, but there is a lot of research in her lab that is. Um, what I'm looking at in Malcolm Knapp Research Forest is how um, warming nitrogen and logging are impacting the multitrophic interactions. So, um, but it is important to think of how disrupting these mycorrhizal networks can result from things like tillage. So there's a lot of discussion on how we can, um, how should we till the soil in an agricultural system, and how should we how should we log? Should we pull the trees out or should we leave them? So um, I'm also involved with some research with Suzanne's lab where they're going, um, they're trying different treatments to see how leaving some more trees in versus taking them out would impact the network effect. And how you study the impacts is you do labeling experiments to see where like the carbon transport through the system. And, okay, so another one, which may be much different now that we have <laughs> interesting things going down south. So if we have um, changes in uh, climate change as predicted by models, and if it gets worse, then we can have a lot of implications um, based on warming and um, nitrogen deficit and all these different things because um, the whole ecosystem will have shifts, and that will cause shifts with the mycorrhizae. And because they're so complex, it's really hard to 
know exactly what's going to happen, but that's why we're doing experiments. And some, something that's definitely been shown for certain in lots of studies is the microbiosal diversity will shift. Some, often down. So sometimes up, but it depends on the, the system. So therefore, humans can help them by learning more about mycorrhizae. So my dad had asked earlier about a TED Talk. So this one's um, by Suzanne Smart, and she did that in June last year. And it's on how trees talk to each other. So this one, um, you can learn more about the research uh, related to the mother tree and things in this talk. And it, uh, I think she really enjoyed giving it, and I enjoy watching it. So, But of course, I'm biased. But you should go and watch it. And so learning about the mycorrhiza um, education is really important because not only will you know more about it, but you might make that connection and then share with someone else, and then someone else might share to someone else, and then it may go down the grapevine to um, politicians. We never know, because we're a part of a social network too, right? And so we impact all each other all the time, and so the more knowledge you have, it could trickle down to other people. So I often do a lot of um, volunteering with children, and they actually impact their family, because the family tends to People care if your child bugs them about recycling, they will go and recycle. So I remember meeting the mayor once, and he mentioned that he thought more about recycling because his five-year-old was making such a big fit that he wasn't recycling properly. So there is a big impact of educating yourself and children and all these things to make sure you learn more about these things. And then other things you can do, oh, sorry, is when you're gardening, or doing things in your daily life, just think mindfully about what you're doing. So maybe instead of ripping out all of your soil and and not you know adding manure and all these different things, maybe you can um, think more about what types of uh, what kind of food web would you want. And so there's uh, my supervisor has mentioned Elaine Ingham before, and she does a business called Soil. Food Web Inc., I believe, and if you look that up, there's some interesting things, uh, uh, seminars for the public on how to promote healthy so soil food webs. So that's something, and what she says, and again, I don't know because I'm not in this area, is a lot of times when you have a proper soil food web, you don't need to use a lot of fertilizer, you don't need to use a lot of pesticides, you don't need to do much watering, it's because it's, it's, it's actually doing it itself. So that's something to be really mindful of that helps the mycorrhiza, but also helps other stuff. Yes. El Elaine Ingham? Yeah. yeah. And it's, I think it's Soil Food Web Inc. Yeah. And it, everyone's welcome to come talk to me afterwards, even after the, the main questions, and I can give you more resources if you want. So, yeah. All right. And then also, another thing that you can get involved with is just thinking globally. So what kind of things could you do globally with respect to the environment that could possibly not only help the mycorrhiza, but help the rest of the ecosystem too? So, and another thing that I had this sort of shift in my own mind, so I have training in botany, so I was looking at it from this, but then people who are in mycorrhizal land are thinking there. And then someone who's like, you know, and now I'm kind of in both worlds. So think of it as the tip of the iceberg, this, and there's tons going on down here. So what about our conservation efforts thinking about both realms, right? So it's important to think not just up above here, but also below ground. So when there's policy and, and ideas about how to restore things, just it's interesting to think, are they considering what's happening in the soil? Maybe, maybe not. But there is more, there is starting to be a shift to care more about the soil, but it's still slow. Because again, we live on this top part, right? And we like trees, and people are like, oh, worms, whatever. So it's really, really, really important to think about how the restoration can go on in the soil to help above. Because I think of it as the tip of the iceberg. So to conclude, mycorrhizae are way cool. They can be harmed, but we can help them. And thank you so much. And I know I'm always kind of bumbly, so I'm sorry for that. Please share your questions and ideas. And I know that some of you may actually want to do something. So here is things you can possibly do. So you can join the Vancouver Mycological Society or help in the community. So there's restoration projects going on in Metro Vancouver Parks. 
And my friend Emma has mentioned this global fungal red list. You can actually log on and help with that. And you can apply and do things like permaculture, because um, permaculture is interesting in terms of healthy soil. So here's the permaculture BC. So I will leave this up for a little bit, and then I have the references on the next slide. But if anyone has questions, um, please feel free to ask. Thank you.